Hi, I'm Marnie Wasserman with Jesse Chavis from the Ultima Health Podcast. Welcome back to another Focus Friday, where we give you short bursts of information and inspiration to set your weekend off on the right foot. And today we're going to be talking all about trimester two. So we are just headed into trimester three. I'm week 28 right now. And we've had a whole lot of experience over the last number of months. And we can't wait to fill you in on how the ultimate baby is doing and how mama is doing. And how Dada is doing. And if you haven't listened already, we did a whole Focus Friday on the first trimester, right when we got into the second trimester. So similar type of episode as we're going to be doing now. Not essential listening to enjoy this episode, but we're going to link it up in the show notes. And you should definitely have a listen when you get a chance. But let's get right into Mama and some of the changes we've been seeing physically. Yeah, and right off the bat, the biggest change, of course, is that I popped in trimester two, and this happened around week 18. So it was very noticeable, really, between week 16 and 18. Week 16, I had no belly. Week 18, all of a sudden, there was a little bump there. And ever since, it's just grown bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's been a really cool experience to actually feel that change because I think for so long, especially in the first trimester, I just wanted to have that bump. I wanted to feel the experience of being pregnant rather than just knowing that I was pregnant. And how do you feel now that the bump's here? Are you excited? I am. Luckily, it hasn't been taking too much out of me and I've been feeling really good, which I'll probably get into later on in this episode, but it's a cute little bump and our baby's in there. So it's just so special. I think I might represent... I don't know what percentage, but I know some women don't love being pregnant, but I feel like I'm one of hopefully a good handful of women who do love being pregnant. I love the experience. I love feeling the baby. And now that the baby's kicking, of course, that happened around week 20 when the movement started. I think I knew that they had started earlier, but I wasn't in tune with the feeling of it until we went to our midwife appointment and she had felt the kicks. And then afterwards, we got confirmation that the baby was kicking. So I think now that, Jess, you and I have this experience with feeling the baby move, it's just so special. Yeah. I mean, pretty much not a day goes by where both of us don't feel kicks. I know you're feeling them all day long. And you'll oftentimes tell me when there's a kicking episode occurring, and I'll come over and put my hands on your belly. And it's just such a special thing that really hard to put into words, but it's happening and it makes it so real and and we're just so excited. It's pure magic is what it is. And whether it's kicks, I think kicks is the general term that we give to it, but I for sure think that some of them are punches, some are somersaults, maybe cartwheels. We get some body swipes where I can see what might be an elbow or a fist swipe from one side of my belly to the other. It's so surreal that there's this being and this creature growing inside my belly and every single week it's getting bigger and bigger. So now it's almost the size of, I think we're in the acorn squash arena and the baby is more or less the length that it's going to be when it's born. It's just a matter of it filling out and refining some of the features and some of the processes inside the body and just fattening up essentially. I think it was earlier today you told me that the baby is now as long as a A loaf of Wonder Bread. I think that was from your app today. (laughs) Yeah, nice comparison. So as long as a loaf of Wonder Bread. But yeah, if that gives you a reference point as of today, the day that we're recording. And I know you've been waiting for this moment to be pregnant and become a mom for a long time. And it's just so awesome to see you fully embracing the process so far. And it's one thing to say it, and it's one thing to actually be going through it. And just seeing the joy day in, day out you're having throughout the whole process is just magical. Yeah, and it's nice that I actually had that aspiration to love the journey of pregnancy before I was pregnant. Now that I actually am, and more than halfway through it, it's been this very positive experience. And I think that has a lot to do with how we're handling this, everything that we're doing, everything that we're eating, the lifestyle that we're living. I think that plays a big part. So that's gonna be a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, all the different things that we've done to keep me and baby and daddy and Goji, our whole family, as healthy as possible. So yeah, it's been awesome. And just one other thing I want to mention just about having a bump is I know that a lot of women don't like to be touched when they're pregnant. They're very standoffish about having their belly rubbed or people coming up and saying like, oh, you know, how's the baby? I think people should ask for sure, but I am not one of those people who feels uncomfortable with people touching their belly. I actually like the energy of it. So That's been a nice part of the experience too, is just sharing 
my body and my bump with others, especially family. And also in regards to my body and my bump, something that I've been doing and something that I've been practicing every single day, pretty much consistently, most of trimester two is moisturizing my bump. So people have told me about this. It's something that I've read about because the goal is to prevent stretch marks and to keep everything as tight and lustrous as possible. So I've been really consistent with that. So I've been moisturizing my belly with my good friend has a beautiful product, uh, Joyous Health. It's called her Body Butta, B-U-T-T-A. We'll put a link in our show notes. And it's so clean, so beautiful. It's shea butter, coconut butter. It smells so good. It's very thick. So I put some in my palms, I just let it get warm, rub my belly, I also rub my breasts, anywhere that I think that there is going to be potential stretch marks, areas that have had rapid growth. So it's been a nice way to keep my self-care ritual really consistent. And another area of my body that I'm massaging and lubricating daily is my perineum area. So this is a really good practice, especially halfway through your pregnancy, if not earlier, but definitely don't wait too long because you want to make sure that you get your body really moisturized in that area to prevent any tearing and to keep the tissues really soft in that area. So I've been using an olive oil salve, and every day when I get out of the shower, I've been massaging that area as well. And it's also important not only to just tackle the nourishment of my body from the outside, what I've been doing from the inside is taking supplements, things like collagen and gelatin in food form. So there's a lot of collagen powders that... Jesse and I love, which you probably know if you've been listening to the show for a while, we use Perfect Keto, we use Spruce, beautiful products that are in our elixirs and our smoothies daily. And getting that nutrition in from the inside out is also helping with my body with collagen and elastin and keeping the tissues really soft and supple. And this is something that we talked about in our episode with Mama Natural. So it's not just about putting things on topically, it's about getting the nourishment in to your body as well. And something I want to get more of in my body is gelatin, which you can buy as a separate supplement. And what I like to do with gelatin specifically is make gummies, which is a win-win because not only am I getting the gelatin, but I get to make these delicious gummies, which I know you're a big fan of, right, Jess? Yeah, I definitely love them. And is there a recipe on your blog for those? Actually, the recipe is in my book, A Real Treat. So we can link that up as well too. Yeah, it's just incredible what you can do with those. I actually make solid gummies I mean, you need to keep them in the fridge. They're not like gummies that you'd buy at a candy store type thing, but they are so good and purely clean ingredients. Yeah, and I put them in little molds so I can have fun with the different sizes of them. And you can also just put them into a container and eat it like jello. So I'll just cut them into cubes too, and we'll just have a big hunk of it for dessert. And it's a nice way to satisfy the sweet craving at night, especially when I make it with tart cherry juice. It's also good, good for sleep. So again, a win-win all around and a delicious, nutritious way to get some gelatin into my body. So other changes with my body and things as, you know, the body grows and as I progress through this is getting out of breath easily. And I know, Jess, when we go for walks, you've been noticing this, that someone like me who's pretty fit and pretty active, I'm, you know, going through a couple of blocks and I'm like winded. I'm out of breath. Yeah, that's been happening for quite some time now, I guess. Thinking back, probably early trimester two, where I still remember one time we were just going for a walk really close to our home, maybe 10 minutes away, and we were like halfway there and you were getting out of breath. We were going to the bank. Yeah, again, I'm used to seeing you, you know, out running and spinning and doing all these things and the changes in your body now just won't allow you to. So what I really like to see though is the fact that you've been listening to your body and you've been slowing down. And I think that's just so important to listen to yourself during this whole process of being pregnant. We're going to get into some of the exercises you've been doing, but you've really tailored it to where you're at during the pregnancy. Yeah, it's been hard because there have been days, obviously the weather's a little bit colder and not as conducive to going for a run or a bike anymore, but it was very tempting to want to kind of push it a little bit harder. But one thing we did do throughout the entire second trimester is we pretty much went to the farmer's market every Saturday by bike, which I was able to do. And we did take it at Marnie pace, which is a little bit slower than normal, (laughs) which I'm usually the speed demon and going ahead. But I was like, just taking my time. I didn't want to push it and just being really easy on myself and on my body because I'm feeling it. And now that the baby is much bigger than when we were on the bikes, when we were on the bikes, I was still in a good phase where the bump wasn't really in the way. 
but I couldn't imagine getting on a bike now and being so out of breath. And especially the babies feel so high in my chest, it would not be comfortable. So that's another reason too that I'm probably out of breath is that I feel like the baby's just like sitting right on my lungs and my diaphragm and making it so hard to breathe. Well, I think the timing worked out really well because when you started to get really big, just in the last little bit, given the time of year, we were going to be slowing down anyways, getting off the bikes. And usually in wintertime, we tend to slow down. So we're going to talk about in a little bit, the fact when we went to Mexico on our baby moon, how the heat affected you there. But I think we didn't time it this way, but our timing of being pregnant just worked out perfectly. It did. As the weather got cooler, I was probably and am getting hotter. So it's just been a nice contrast to the way that I'm feeling. And on that note, with just things feeling up high is when it comes to eating, I'm feeling really full really fast. So I'm just kind of feeling that pressure in my body, in my upper chest. So it makes it harder to eat as much as I normally would. So it's been an adjustment. And, you know, you mentioned going to Mexico. And again, we'll talk about the whole travel section of trimester two. But just in relation to my body is that being in the heat not only kept me out of breath, but my body got very swollen. My ankles got very swollen. And we were going on hikes. We were busy. We were on our, I was definitely on my feet more than I probably should be. And I was feeling the effect of that. By the end of the day, I need to put my feet up high and just let some of that fluid just drain out. So it was a really interesting transition again. And now I'd say they're a lot better now being back home in the cooler weather, but I still can start to see how they're a bit thicker than normal. So I know that that is a common pregnancy symptom is to have swollen ankles. So just something to be mindful of and nothing to really worry about. Just make sure it's not everywhere in the body. I think some people can experience really high swelling during pregnancy. And luckily, I don't have that. I just have a little bit of my ankles. And I think that's totally normal with all that weight and pressure on my feet. Yeah, it's really interesting throughout the pregnancy to this point. You mentioned the ankles. And obviously, we talked about how your belly is busting through now. And it's really visible. Your body in general, other than those two things, hasn't changed. So it's really interesting. We're now two thirds of the way through. It'll be interesting to see if there's any other changes throughout the third trimester. But given the stage you're at now, you haven't gone through that much of a physical transformation in these other areas of your body. No, I haven't. So it's just been mostly belly changes and and that's about it, you know, and some breast changes, <laughs> but it's been overall pretty good. Oh yeah, the so, breast too. <laughs> so yeah, you know, since we brought up exercise, I may as well mention some of the different things that I've been doing for exercise because that is different from trimester one. In trimester one, I really wasn't feeling like doing anything much more than a walk or maybe a simple bike ride. I was not keeping consistent with my weight routine or exercise routine in the morning. I was tired. I just didn't really have the stamina to do anything. So pretty much after the 12 to 14 week mark is when I started doing some videos at home and I had been told about the Tracy Anderson method videos. I may have mentioned this on trimester one because I think I was dabbling in it, but it wasn't consistent. So those have been pretty much more regular in my weeks. The way that they're laid out is by month. So I don't like to do them more than a couple times a week because they're about a 40 to 50 minute long video. So it's a lot of time. And I I find that I really get a good workout out of each one of those. So those have been fun. I have access to that. So that's been something you can pay for online. Trace Anderson has tons of different kinds of videos, but the prenatal ones have been good. I've been enjoying them. And another one that I've been doing is the Glowing Mamas videos, which is a week by week video set of different kinds of fitness routines. And it takes you from all the way from trimester one into your third trimester week by week so that things that you are doing and being taught are conducive to where your body is at. So that's been something that's been great because they're only about 10 to 15 minutes, which is perfect and kind of what I have energy for. So I've been sliding those into most mornings of the week. And we've been doing our morning walks like we always do with Goji. And now that the weather's changing, it's it's going to be you know a little bit more work to layer up and get out there, but we'll continue to do that. And it's just such a great way that our family can start each and every day. Yeah. And we've gone to yoga, the yoga classes that we were taking before. You and I have done a few yoga classes, not too many. That slowed down a bit. That slowed down quite a bit. But I've been doing prenatal yoga. So that started in my early second trimester as well, where I started going to Monday night prenatal yoga classes. And that's been a really fun adjunct to my routine as well. 
And all the exercises and yoga poses are, again, very conducive to being pregnant. So it's important to make sure that you find classes where the teacher knows exactly what positions you can and can't go into, no matter what stage of pregnancy you're in. So those have been really fun. And another benefit of that, too, is the community. So you're in there with a lot of other pregnant mamas, and you get to see different people who might be a little bit behind you in the pregnancy, a little bit ahead of you, see where you're going. And just connect with different people and talk about your experience on this journey. And you've also been lucky enough that you have a couple of friends that are going through this journey around the same time as you that live close by. So I want to emphasize the importance of these other mamas in your life and how being able to communicate with them and share in a community with them the importance of that. So important. And that's a great point, Jess, because when we decided to get pregnant, I had no idea which pockets of friends or community that I would have access to to be able to share this experience with. So not only did I definitely not expect any of my friends to be pregnant, so that's been a really nice bonus, but to find things like the prenatal yoga and, you know, there's for sure going to be other things too. And even just going to different stores that we've been shopping at for the baby, we're finding out and meeting more people. So there's just such a beautiful aspect to that too and just connecting with other people. So I've been loving that. And one area that we could be getting some community in that we're not because we chose to do it online is some of the birthing classes that we're doing. So a lot of people do take in-person birthing classes, which is something we toyed with the idea of, but we ended up getting access to some incredible birthing courses. And Jesse and I registered in one early on in the pregnancy, and we waited until, I think, into our second trimester when we actually started the videos. I think we waited until after You know, I passed the 12-week mark and everything was in the clear and everything felt good. So we started those ones. But also when we had Mama Natural on the podcast, we really wanted to do her birth course. So we've been doing that one now consistently. And then there's another one that I've been doing as well called Love Your Labor. I connected with this wonderful girl online and she's got this beautiful course that I am just soaking up all this information. So we have three courses that we have access to and now Jesse and I can just find time at night and spend anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the videos or the content of the course, and just soak up all this incredible knowledge because there is so much to learn out there. So that's been really fun. And even though we're not doing that in a community setting, Jesse and I have each other. And I'm very lucky that Jesse's willing to be part of this whole experience because I'm sure there's some guys who don't want to sit through a birth class video online and Jesse gets just as excited as I do. Yeah, we've been having a lot of fun with those. And coming back to the community aspect, if another person listening to this feels like they don't have community in other areas like you do, maybe going to an in-person birthing class would be a better option. But for us, we have so many resources and so much we're going through. And and up until this point, we've been super busy. So the online classes have been really working for us. And in addition to that, we've continued our reading. There's been books that we've been reading from the first trimester, now into the second, the books have changed. So some of the books that I'm reading currently are Birthing from Within. That was highly recommended to me on Instagram. The Birth Partner, I got that book, but I gave it to my mom because my mom is part of my birth team. So she is reading that currently right now, and then I'm going to hand that over to Jess. And I'm also reading Real Food Pregnancy. And Ina May, I had read her Guide to Childbirth, and now I'm reading The Breastfeeding One. Those are kind of some of the ones on the roster right now, and I've got a whole bunch of books on hold for trimester three, so I'll get to those ones a little bit later. But Jess, why don't you talk about the books that you're reading right now? Well, I've actually only partially read one book so far, Dude, You're Going to Be a Dad. But in queue right now, I have The Birth Partner. I'm going to read that one when I finish this book. But I think it's just, for me, the reason I haven't read a lot of stuff specifically on pregnancy, is just preparing for these interviews each and every week. There is often a book to read, and I've been keeping super busy with my reading, preparing for the interview, so I haven't had a lot of extra time in that realm to dig into the parenting books yet. But again, like we mentioned before, we're doing these courses, and Marnie and I have been listening to podcasts. We had Mama Natural on the podcast, and I read her book, preparing for that interview. So I guess that's another book I did read. And there's just so many different areas that you can get into to get this information. And we've both been wholeheartedly embracing that and learning. So I'm learning, but not as much in the reading realm yet. 
And now that we're in the home stretch and it's becoming more real every single day and closer and closer, I feel like for both of us, the pressure is going to be on to like want to read as much as we can in these next three months. Because, you know, nine months at first kind of seems like a long time and you've got all these books. And now that we're down to just under three months, it's kind of crazy. So I think we're both going to be crash coursing a little bit. Well, and we're also going to be slowing down, which we've been traveling quite a bit over the last period. We had our baby moon, like we talked about. We went to Mexico, and we also went to California right after that and visited a friend for a few days. Then we went to Chicago for a weekend shortly after that and celebrated Marnie's birthday. We went to Toronto. We just actually got back from Toronto. We did another weekend away to visit with friends and with Marnie's mom. So things have been go, go, go lately, and now we're finally getting to slow down and nest, which is something we're both really ready for. And with that, we're going to have a lot more time to learn and read and just slow down in general and finish getting the baby's room ready, which we've started as well. Yeah, I've been counting down the days just to get this nursery done and ready. And it's just such a fun process. And at first, I don't think I took it as seriously because there's two rooms in our house that we now flopped. So there was our studio room that we had our podcast studio in. And then there was this extra spare bedroom that I was kind of using as my closet in this kind of random room. So we, we called it Marnie's second closet. Marnie's second closet. And we had anticipated that room, which is actually this room right now that we're recording from, being the baby's room. And it just seemed like, you know, a good size. It was small. It was cute. And because the podcast studio was already set up, like didn't even think about changing the rooms until we started considering our furniture after we actually ordered our furniture, took down some of the measurements, and it became a reality. And I came into the room. I started putting tape on the ground and mapping it all out. And I was like, this room is not going to work. And I started to get a little bit anxious. I'm like, what are we going to do? Or do we have to change our furniture? Or which kind of directions and ways can we structure this room to make it work? I popped my head into the podcast studio and I was like, This room is way bigger. It's got two beautiful windows. It gets beautiful daytime sunlight. And we don't need a big room for our recordings. This would make a way better baby room. So I just remember the day that I said to Jess, I was like, honey, I think we need to switch our rooms around. (laughs) And that involved a lot more than it sounds because our podcast studio, for any of you who follow us on Instagram, you know that Jesse takes this room very seriously. And there's panels all over the walls. There's the equipment. There's a bookshelf. Not too much furniture, but it just involved a lot, especially to move all the panels. So it was kind of a no-brainer, and we just did it. We took about, I think, over the course of two weeks, maybe three at the most. We had the internet changed, so the Wi-Fi wasn't in there. We peeled all the Velcro and all the panels off the walls, and Jess, you had fun moving it over, right? Yeah, it was a lot of work, but I'm really happy we did. And I'm more happy with this studio now than before in this new room. It's just the perfect size. And what it did, moving rooms, it inspired me to get in and actually finish the sound paneling, which I had never totally finished in the other room. So now we have more sound paneling up. We actually ordered a bunch more sound paneling. And we have this room acoustically set up really, really well. And it feels complete. And it feels really good. So it's been fun recording in here. And then the room now, which is Tubbs' room, the ultimate baby, is getting ready to go. So we decided we wanted to paint the walls, which at first I didn't think we'd have to paint. But because we had peeled so many things off the wall, we knew it needed a bit of a patch job. So luckily we timed that very well for when we went away to Mexico. For about 10 days, we had the opportunity to have the painter come in while we were gone. Even though we use non-toxic paint, there's still a little bit of residue with that. And I'm extremely sensitive for those of you who listen to our Focus Friday on chemical sensitivities and minimizing your chemicals, I can't tolerate any smell. So if there was any chance that there was going to be any off-gassing from the paint at all, even if it was natural, I didn't want it. So we did that while we were away. We have this beautiful off-white color in there, very neutral because we do not know the gender of the baby and we wanted to keep everything very neutral and very natural. And the furniture that we have gotten so far, just the crib and the chair, fits in there perfectly and we can just see how the layout of the room is just going to be perfect. So now we're in that phase, as Jesse was saying, where we're really excited to get the rest of the room ready. We've got blinds to put up. We're waiting on a dresser. I've got my baby shower coming up in a couple of weeks where that's going to give an opportunity to get me (laughs) and tub lots of stuff to fill up the room and 
make it beautiful and very cozy. And this room is just coming together really well. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun and I'm really excited to finish it off and just see it as a whole. But I can't say enough about how beautiful it is already. The lighting in there is amazing with the two windows. And there's been a couple of times I've actually looked in there and thought the light was on in the room because just the light coming in through the windows is incredible in there. And where we actually registered for a lot of our furniture and where we're starting to purchase a lot of furniture is a local store called Three Lambs. And they do such a good job at sourcing eco and non-toxic products. So we know that the things that we're getting have already been vetted. So our crib is non-toxic. It's like a beautiful walnut wood. Our chair doesn't off-gas. So those are from a brand called Baby Leto. And we're really excited about that. And in addition, all the other things that we've been getting for the baby, like the stroller and the car seat and our little play yard, is the brand called Nuna which we absolutely fell in love with when we did our little tour of the store to find out about all the different product lines. Nuna was the one that stood out to us for our stroller car seat and play yard, and they're beautiful. So we have those in the house. A lot of them were gifted by my parents, which was really nice, and Jesse and I invested in some of this stuff. So we're just excited to start to put that together too. So other things that have taken place over the course of the last number of months is meeting with our doula. She actually came to the house and did a home visit which was great because we are planning a home birth. So it was nice to have her come and see the space that we're going to be in and take us through things that are going to go right, things that could go wrong, everything that's involved in a home birth and even just a birth in general. So it was a really comprehensive meeting. We spent about two to three hours, got to know her a lot better. And it was just great to, again, create that vision of our ideal birth plan. It was really fun. Yeah, we have an amazing birth plan in place, but Marnie and I are both aware that certain things can happen during uh, delivery and we're open to evolving and, and changing as things unravel, but we're hoping for the best and we're hoping that everything goes smoothly, but we are preparing across the full spectrum just so we are ready for whatever comes at us. Exactly. And all we can do is prepare and plan and do our best. And we have our tub rental booked already. We have yet to meet with the midwives who are going to kind of take us through a more in-depth home birth situation where we're going to have checklists of things that we need to get and all that. So that's going to be a little bit later. So it's an interesting journey, interesting process, but we've been loving already some of the meetings we've had with our midwives. I've been seeing them pretty much every four weeks up until now. And I think it's going to shift into every two weeks here on in. And all of our meetings have been pretty good. We come with some questions. Some weeks we have more questions than others. Otherwise, they've just started to kind of measure, feel around. And our very last appointment was awesome because we got to hear the baby's heartbeat. Yeah, we've both gone to all the appointments together, which is awesome. And we're just so lucky to both work from home and be entrepreneurs. And we're just so grateful to be able to fully experience the whole birthing process so far. And like Marnie just mentioned, the last time we went and saw the midwife, we actually got to hear the baby's heartbeat. And there was three different tools, actually, that they used for us to be able to hear the heartbeat. This almost archaic white, it's kind of like a cone type thing that went on Marnie's belly. And and the midwife and myself got to use that and put our ear right against it and hear the heartbeat that way. And then there was a fetoscope, which is like a stethoscope for baby, a specific one that's shorter. Marnie couldn't actually get that all the way up to her ears to be able to hear the baby's heartbeat. But again, the midwife and myself, we got to listen with that as well and hear the heartbeat. And then she broke out the stethoscope final at the end. And all three of us got to hear the heartbeat. And it was just such a special moment because that was the first time outside of the ultrasounds that we were able to hear the heartbeat. It was amazing. And we were so happy because I think the appointment before that, either the baby was in a different position or it was just too hard to hear the heartbeat at that point. But with the stethoscope, it was so clear and so evident that that was the little baby's fast heart rate. And the reason why we've done all these alternative tools is because we've opted out of the Doppler, which of course is available to anyone if they see a midwife or a doctor. You can do that at any point. But we are trying to go as low intervention as possible. And the Doppler just doesn't seem like a necessary tool that we want to use at this point. I was willing to wait as long as we did, which was about week 25 when we heard the heart rate. And, you know, that was very little intervention, just a little stethoscope on my belly. And it was worth the wait. And it was interesting to hear as well, because in the second ultrasound we had done, 
the baby in the report, it showed that the baby was breech at that point, and the midwife was able to palpate on our last appointment and feel that the baby was head down at this point. So the baby's rotated, the baby's head down. I'm not too sure if that flips back and forth or how that works throughout the third trimester, but it was interesting to see that evolution. Yeah. And luckily, you know, when we heard the word breach, of course, you know, people get concerned. But that was early on where she was like not concerned. She was like, this is normal at this point. The baby has yet to turn. But from what we believe, and I think I know now because lately this past week, I've been feeling the baby hiccup quite a bit. And I've been feeling that in my lower groin pelvis area. So that's giving me indication that the baby is head down if that's where I'm feeling the hiccup. So we'll hope for the best and wait for our next midwife appointment and see what happens. But as I just mentioned, we've been opting out of many things like the Doppler. We only did our two ultrasounds, which is kind of what we had planned on. And we did the early one at 12 weeks and we did one at 20 weeks and feel no need to do one again unless something, of course, comes up that requires it. And I don't plan on doing the glucose test or any other invasive interventions or things that just don't feel right or aligned with me. So at this point here on in, we're just going to listen to the baby naturally and listen to my body and just go through this next trimester as low key as possible. As I mentioned earlier, we did opt out of finding out the sex of the baby. So we are holding strong on that, even though we are both really excited to find out the gender, especially now that we're getting close, but we're excited to keep that surprise. And our plan at this point is to have a second child. And we're happy that we've held out with this first child and finding out the sex. We're excited about that surprise during the birth. But we have talked about for the second kid, I think we will end up finding out the sex beforehand. It's been fun, but it'll be fun also to be surprised partway through next time. So some of the practitioners that I mentioned in trimester one, I'm still seeing quite a few of them. And they've been a big part of my journey and my self-care and just, I think, the success of the way that my body's been feeling. And that is Reiki. Actually, I haven't gotten Reiki since early on in the first trimester. So I'm really looking forward to that. I have an appointment this week, so I'm excited for that. Reflexology, I go every two weeks. So that's been a really nice add-on to keeping my feet feeling good, especially with the ankle swelling, just keeping just the pressure points active and keeping things flowing. I love the way that the reflexology feels. Massage therapy, so I've been doing that, I'd say once a month. And I saw a pelvic floor specialist early on in the pregnancy. And then I've had a couple of appointments since, and that really gave me an understanding of my pelvic floor and understanding how to access different spots in my pelvis and my rectum and anywhere in between. There's so many different areas to access because I think a lot of people know about Kegels and just one way, like stopping the flow of urine, one way to kind of squeeze up, but there's so much more to that and so much more you want to be aware of with your pelvic floor in preparation for birth. So that's been a really helpful tool. And I recommend that to anybody to find out the state of their pelvis when they are going through pregnancy, because some people have weaker and stronger pelvises. And it's good to have someone who can feel and understand and give you the right exercises to do. And you're still doing those exercises currently, right? I am. I'm trying to practice those every day, sometimes multiple times a day, and all part of preparing my body for labor and delivery. So really important. And another thing that I've been doing is I'd like to be doing it more consistently, but I have been incorporating meditations into my morning practice, whether it's guided or whether it's just connecting with my belly and the baby. Like to me, that is a meditation, just putting my hand on my belly and breathing and talking to Tub and just feeling my body and feeling how I'm feeling and just checking in. So I'm trying to be as consistent with that as possible without it being too formal and too much pressure on myself to make sure I get it in. It's just usually when I wake up, deep breathing, and as I said, sometimes I'm doing some guided meditations. So let's talk about food and nutrition, something that I love to talk about, something I love to learn about. And as the pregnancy has progressed, there is a lot of learning that I've done in this area, but all in all, not too much has changed. I wouldn't say that I am eating any differently than my diet before I was pregnant. I might be more focused in on certain nutrients. I might be making sure I'm eating certain things more regularly or I might be gravitating towards certain foods. But overall, I can't say like, oh, all of a sudden I'm eating all this crappy food because I'm pregnant or I'm eating so much more because I'm pregnant. 
I think that is all a myth. You do not need to eat for two. I just don't even know how. Physically, I don't know how because I get so full so fast. So maybe there's opportunities for me to have more frequent meals or maybe there's opportunities where I'm eating a good meal and it tastes so good and I want an extra portion and I let myself off the hook because I'm pregnant. But I couldn't say, could you, Jess, that I'm like eating so much more? No, I would say quantities are very similar. Diet is very similar. A couple things that jump out at me talking about this, though, your cheese intake, I think, is increased. And because of your iron levels, which we can get into a little bit more, your red meat intake has increased as well in the last little bit. So do you want to talk about your iron level and what that's been doing? Yeah. Well, you mentioned cheese. I'll talk about that first. I mentioned that in the first trimester episode, how my craving for goat and sheep dairy specifically, so we're not talking cow dairy here, has been very consistent. I've always loved cheese, but I think I've given myself, that is one of those foods that I give myself the free pass to where every day I'm like, okay, it's time for some cheese and crackers, or I can put a little cheese on my sandwich or like, let's make pizza tonight or tacos and I'm going to put cheese on it. So I don't regulate it. Whereas before I might have restricted myself to a couple times a week. And now it's pretty much every day. I don't always have it, but I'd say more days than not. And I love it. And I love the way I feel on it. And I have not reacted to it in any way. No bloating, no gas, no skin issues. So my body seems to be soaking it up. Do you find you're keeping it more moderate before because of your Hashimoto's? I think that was part of it because I know that dairy is not ideal for Hashimoto's, but I also know that I've always felt good on sheep and goat dairy, which is why I wasn't vegan for long stretches at a time. It's because I always brought goat and sheep dairy into the mix because I actually felt okay on it. But I think it was kind of in the back of my head too. Like, I just don't love the idea of consuming a lot of dairy, but you got to weigh out how you feel on it. And I felt so good on it. And when I know I'm getting it from a good source... And sheep and goat dairy just taste so good. Well, I think too, recently you got the green light with your antibodies. You get your regular blood work done. You always get blood work done because of your Hashimoto's, but your blood work has been, I think, a little bit more frequent since you were pregnant. And on your most recent test, I know your antibodies are, I think, at their basically lowest they've ever been with the cheese that you've been consuming, the extra cheese. So I think that gives you the green light now in your mind to, you know, eat cheese as freely as you want, especially while you're pregnant. Well, it goes to show that the diet or my diet may not have been the only contributing factor to high antibody levels. So it was probably so many other things that I think you and I as a whole tackled so much of our gut health and different aspects of our health before I got pregnant, which I think made a big difference. And now I think since I've been pregnant, there's probably just been my body is just in this really good place. And for whatever reason, the antibodies are really low, which I'm not complaining about. And then back to the iron, as you brought up, and eating more red meat. So this kind of came up as a, a little bit of a red flag. I'd say a few weeks ago, we did get a call from the midwife. And they always say, if you don't get a call from us, it's a good thing after any blood work. But if you do get a call from us, we usually have something to tell you. So when we got the phone call, we were both a little nervous at first. <laughs> but all she wanted to share is that my iron levels were pretty low and she was a little bit concerned and just wants to make sure that we find different ways to boost them up, especially because we are planning a home birth. So I have been consistent with my iron supplement since the beginning, but I think I'm going to start to up that. We actually just changed over iron supplements to Designs for Health. I'm using their iron, the Ferro Keel. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but we'll put it in our show notes. <laughs> but it's a great iron supplement. So I'm taking that now. I'm eating more red meat. So I'd say as opposed to eating it one or two times a month, we've now brought it into our lives pretty much once a week. So I'm having it as ground meat. You've made steaks. I'm eating a lot of darker chicken, making sure that we're eating that more than any kind of white meat. So any kind of dark meat has been a priority and making sure I'm trying to get that in every day and cooking in cast iron. That's been another way that I've been trying to increase my iron stores and adding in some citrus foods when I am eating any animal protein. So that can help any foods that do contain iron. If you have a little bit of grapefruit or orange or even lemon with that, that can help the absorption of it. So those are things that I've been mindful of and hopefully by my next blood work, it makes a difference. And you've also been taking vitamin C as a supplement with your iron supplement. So the whole increasing the absorption is from the vitamin C specifically. Yes, exactly. So those have been two big changes. Other than that, as I said, my diet hasn't changed much. I'm really sticking to nutrient-dense foods, things like avocado, green leafy vegetables, eggs more days than not. So maybe that's another food too that I've been a little bit more regular with is eggs. 
berries, yogurt, goat or sheep kefir, and bone broth. So I've been making lots of bone broth and I've been making extra bone broth so that I can store it for when the baby arrives and we make sure that we have bone broth ready to go in the freezer. And I think that's going to be another thing that we really get into during this last third of the pregnancy is making a lot of foods in larger quantities when we're making a dinner, say, and storing that in the freezer. And recently we got a second fridge and a bigger deep freezer from my parents when they moved into a condo. They were downsizing and they were nice enough to gift us these appliances so we can store a lot more goods now. And I know we're going to be doing that to prepare for when the baby comes. Yes. Very important to plan for that and have good nutritious foods on hand, especially homemade. I'm sure people are going to send some stuff in. I'm sure we might go to some healthy places around us and grab some of their delicious, clean, frozen goods and bring them home because probably for the first time in my entire life, I'm probably going to go a couple months without cooking, which is going to be hard. So it'll be nice to have all this stuff ready to go. And of course, I'm going to be stepping it up and increasing my repertoire of recipes and cook Marnie a lot of great food. So I got to get on that in the third trimester too and sharpen up my cooking game. Can't wait to see what's up your sleeve. So in terms of drinking, I've been drinking lots of tea and specifically red raspberry leaf tea and a tea line that I created with a local company here in Windsor called Chalice Spice. We put together a line of baby teas from the first trimester to the third trimester. So I've been drinking those as well. So I think we launched this early on in the second trimester and each tea has a specific blend that works well for what you're going through. So the first trimester has things that help with nausea. So there's ginger in there and quite a few other beautiful herbal teas. And in the second trimester, we start bringing in red raspberry leaf tea and same with the third and a few other different things. We're gonna link that up in our show notes so you can take a look. But I highly recommend it for anyone who is going through pregnancy and wants supportive teas because it can be really confusing when it comes to teas and herbs which ones to consume, which ones not. There are a lot of contraindications. So we have made sure that each tea is totally perfect for that trimester that you're going through. I just finished my second trimester, so now I'm into the third trimester tea. And because it has red raspberry leaf in it, I'm making sure I'm drinking that every day. And I'll probably start upping that to two times a day because it's a uterine tonic and it can really help get the uterus ready. And they say, quote unquote, that it can help with a better delivery. And Mama Natural definitely attests to this. We talked about this in our episode with her. But why not? It tastes good. And if it can only help the baby come out easier and faster, hopefully, <laughs> then then I'm all for it. Tub tea. Tub isn't even born yet and already has a tea, three different teas named after him or her. Yes, very exciting. So we'll be sure to share that with you. And another thing that I'm drinking is matcha. So matcha is a form of green tea, which is caffeinated. And I don't drink a lot of caffeine. I don't gravitate towards it. But the one form that I do like is matcha. And it's something that I really avoided and limited when Jesse and I were trying to get pregnant and early on in the first trimester. But as things have progressed, as I started to feel better, as I started to learn that a little bit of caffeine is okay and not going to do any harm, I got the confidence that it was okay to have one, if not two matcha lattes, and I'm having like a half a teaspoon in the blend that I'm having per time. So I know that it's very little. I don't require a lot of caffeine. And to be honest, I'm not even having it for the caffeine, although I do feel great when I drink it. It's more because I love the taste of matcha. So I'll make a matcha latte or if we're out and about and there's a place that makes a really good matcha latte, I'll enjoy it. So I've been drinking that and lots of water. I am thirsty all the time and I'm making sure I'm staying really well hydrated. So water is a constant and not something to be deprived of while you are going through pregnancy. Your body needs it. Your amniotic fluid needs it. The baby needs it and you need it. Yeah. And you've always been great about water. You always carry a bottle of water around with you. And even if we leave the house, you'll have me pull back in the driveway if you forget your water to make sure you're keeping hydrated. So You're definitely a great inspiration and I got to still step it up in the hydration realm. So you definitely inspire me on that. Thank you. And with that comes, of course, going to the bathroom a lot, which is already a pregnancy symptom because your little baby is sitting on top of your bladder. So when you have all that water going in all the time, that can make for frequent trips, which I'm finding that that's happening to me 
very much during the day, luckily not so much at night. So I, I feel very grateful for that. So lots of water and other things in terms of food. I've been eating a little bit more chocolate. I think in the first trimester, I actually didn't really want chocolate that much. I didn't have an aversion per se, but it was not something I gravitated towards. And now I am consuming more chocolate like usual before (laughs) pre-pregnancy. And in terms of cravings, there really hasn't been too many, but the two things that I could say throughout the pregnancy that I have wanted regularly, or not even that regularly, but is pad thai, (laughs) a good pad thai, a clean pad thai. And luckily we have a couple of places locally that make really good quality pad thais. And I should definitely, I've made my own before. I should make my own again, but sometimes it's just fun to go out. And while we have the chance to go out right now, (laughs) before the baby's born, we are sometimes. So pad thai and healthy chips. So whether that's plantain chips, cassava chips, sweet potato chips made with coconut or olive oil. So we're talking like really good quality. I have not given in to Pringles or Hostess Ruffles or anything like that. We have access to beautiful, clean chips. And I don't have them every day, but when I have them, I feel this deep sense of satisfaction that (laughs) that is different than before. Maybe it's, I don't know, it's a bit of a salty craving. I don't know what it is, but it's delicious. So we have chips on the regular. It's interesting to see the chip market, the quote unquote healthy chip market explode over time. And it seems like almost every time we go to Whole Foods now, there's new healthy chips to look at and try out and explore, which has just been fun. And just to wrap up the nutrition aspect is supplements. So I'm taking some of the same supplements that I started on pre-pregnancy and definitely in the first trimester. So these are things like my prenatals, which I'm certainly going to continue throughout the rest of the pregnancy and postpartum as well. Vitamin D, iron, fish oils. I'm taking a DHA, EPA, probiotics, vitamin C, beef liver capsules, which is another way that I'm getting in some iron and some vitamin A. I also swap the fish oils just going back with a cod liver oil. So sometimes I'm taking the EPA, DHA, and sometimes taking a cod liver oil, magnesium, and K2. I think that's it, right, Jess? Jess gives me my supplements every day, so he knows better than I do. That covers it. <laughs> so yeah, that's my my full spectrum. And I've gotten the question before of why do I take some of these extra ones in addition to my prenatals? The prenatals has so many good things in it, but to get an extra dose of certain things like vitamin D and vitamin C and magnesium, there's no harm in that. And especially when my body is growing and while this baby's growing, I believe that having, you know, an extra solo form of taking that supplement in addition to the prenatal is is totally fine. But if all you can handle is the prenatal, then that's going to cover your basics. So moving into sleep, I mentioned a little bit about sleep, how, you know, I haven't been waking up too much at night to go pee and I've been making sleep a bit of a priority. And it's tough though, because getting into a comfortable position as I've gotten bigger has been a little bit of a challenge. I did get a pregnancy pillow early on, which I know that I mentioned in our previous episode. So that's been my body pillow and right beside me as I flip onto my left side. So most nights I'm starting on my left side and trying to stay there. And I also have a side sleeper pillow, which curves around my head. So I've basically created this little candy cane. If you just picture a long pillow, then I've got my side sleeper pillow around my head that kind of hugs my body. And some people buy these as a full pregnancy pillow, but I have kind of two pillows that make that up for me. And they are organic, which is again, of priority to me and Jesse and our lifestyle. That's the bedding we sleep on, the sheets we use, everything. So I've got that, but I find that I'm adjusting during the night. I sometimes want to flip over onto my right or onto my back because I just can't get comfortable or the baby's moving. So I've heard that it can get a lot tougher from here on in. So I'm just going to have to roll with it. And the odd time I'm waking up at like two or three in the morning and I can't sleep for a bit and then I'll fall back asleep hard at like five to seven or five to eight, and then I'm super groggy. But overall, I'd say my sleep has been pretty good and I feel pretty lucky. And we were just talking about this on our morning walk this morning, the fact that our bedtime has kind of crept up a little bit and gotten a little bit later than we would like lately. And we want to start going to bed maybe a little bit earlier. And this goes along with what we talked about earlier, doing a little bit more reading now. Hopefully we can get to bed a little earlier and get some great books on the nightstand beside our bed and just do some reading and up our sleep game a little bit. 
Yes, I've been feeling a little bit tired, especially with all of our back-to-back travel and all the time changes. It'll be good to get back into a solid routine. And the number one thing that we keep reading in every baby book right now is sleep, sleep, sleep while you can. (laughs) Take advantage of this time. It's hard for me because naps are really hard for me. I was napping more in trimester one. I don't feel like that same urge to take a nap in the middle of the day, but I am going to try my best to embrace as much rest from here until the baby arrives. And another thing I want to do too is make sure we're prioritizing regular date nights. And we're good for this on a regular basis as well. But just knowing how busy things are going to be when the baby's born and how we're going to be tied to the house for the most part, I want to make sure we're getting out and having some nice dinners and getting out to the show. And this is a great time of year to get out to the movies because there's a lot of great movies in the theaters with the Oscars coming up. So we really want to get out on a number of date nights and really take advantage of this time. Yes. Then balance that with what you said before with slowing down because we have been so busy that now we're just, we came home yesterday from Toronto, as Jesse said, and we were just like so happy to be home and just felt this sense of like, oh, just want to get cozy. So I think we probably need like a week or two to just kind of settle in, although we have the baby shower in two weeks. But I think from December will be a really nice month to every Friday night go out to the movies or make some plans with some friends or go visit your parents and have dinner with them. Like there might be these different opportunities to kind of scatter them through the week. And another thing that changed too is this is not really directly related to pregnancy, but it does cover trimester two, which was every Wednesday night we were taking Goji to agility training our dog. So that was something that was in the schedule. And it was a long trek because we were going about 25, 30 minutes out of the way to take her to agility, which was an hour then driving home. So that was every Wednesday for the last 12 weeks. And I think we're just looking forward to having our Wednesday nights back. Yeah, maybe we'll get back into some more restorative yoga. We were doing a lot more yoga before, some yin yoga, and in general, just slowing down because what we find is that everything we're doing, we love and it's beautiful and we're so grateful. It's just the amount of things we're doing. So even when you take on too much of a good thing, it can become overwhelming. You know, we've been redlining it quite a bit lately and it just, I actually used the analogy yesterday when we got home from Toronto, it feels like we just finished a marathon and it's just this great feeling of stepping into this next chapter and knowing that we're going to be able to slow down quite a bit and both of us are on the same page and we're just ready to fully embrace it and we're going to both be aware and make sure we catch ourselves if we're overloading the calendar, just ready to embrace slowing down before baby. And catch up on some of our shows on Netflix and on TV, because now we have cable, which is a whole other story, (laughs) which we didn't have for the longest time. But we actually don't watch that much TV, but we record a few shows, and that is This Is Us, A Million Little Things. And on Netflix, we're watching Atypical. There's a few other things as well, too. But it's just nice to be able to have time to catch up on some of our favorite shows. So the last area I wanted to get into is clothing, which is an interesting one. I'm kind of circling back to the beginning of my body changes. So with the body changes comes a change of clothing because as I start not fitting into a lot of my regular clothing, I've had to make some adjustments. And it's nice that there is some clothes that work really well. Luckily, I'm a pretty sporty person. I wear clothes like Lululemon or different fitness wear that has room for growth and cozy sweatshirts, things like that. And because we're going into the colder season, all these clothes work really well. Big hunky sweaters and scarves, all that stuff that layers works well. So my existing clothing, I've really narrowed it down. There's quite a few leggings I can still wear, some sweatshirts and tank tops. But I did have to go out and get a few other things. There are so many places that you can access maternity clothing, whether it's through consignment shops, whether you do secondhand shopping, whether you find companies online that deliver it to you and then you can ship it back. Those are all an option. I decided to go to a store here locally that is actually, it's called Time Maternity. I think a lot of people know about it. It's in quite a few places around Canada, I think. It is great. So what I decided to do is invest in a few pieces that I could rotate through and things that I actually think I can wear after birth as well that my body will still be able to fit into. So hopefully they're just not pregnancy specific. But having 10 items of clothing that I can rotate through has been such a dream. It's what's called a capsule wardrobe. And I feel really empowered to only be able to pick between these items of clothing, this minimalistic lifestyle, which is so anti-me in clothing, as Jessica can attest to. 
as we talked about, I had a room that was a closet before. <laughs> so now I have 10 pieces of clothing that it makes packing for trips really easy and it makes deciding what to wear every day really easy. So that's just been another change and transformation. And I have gotten a couple of hand-me-downs from other people as well too, which has been a nice add into the mix. But yeah, I'm loving some of these new pieces. Loving the simplicity. And I'm glad you mentioned hand-me-downs. That was something I was going to mention too for people that might not have extra income to purchase new clothes or just why not if you have access to great clothes from somebody else. The chances are maternity clothes aren't going to have been worn a whole lot and they're going to be in great shape. And just along with baby clothes, just what a great way to reuse things. So definitely keep that in mind. Yeah. And to be honest, I wish I had more of that. I wish I had an older sister or cousins or people that were close to me that could gift me more stuff because I wish I didn't have to go out and buy. But you know what? I'm happy that I did. And luckily I got things on sale. I made sure I waited for a very good sale. And a lot of it was just part of a gift as well too for my mom. So it was just a nice way to embrace this stage in my life, which I was so excited for. And why not relish in it. And the funny thing is we don't even go out that much. So it's fun to have a few pieces that when we do go out, I can go out and feel really good and show off my bump and feel very comfortable in what I'm wearing. Yeah, you did get a great deal. And also part of the whole thing too, is that like we mentioned before, we are planning on having a second kid. So you're going to be able to keep all this clothes and hopefully use it again. And it'll be interesting. You mentioned how you're liking the simplicity of this capsule wardrobe. It'll be interesting after you have the baby and you get back into your regular wardrobe, maybe that'll wear off and transpire into your regular clothes too. And you might embrace having less. We'll see. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's just what feels good to you, but you are embracing and enjoying having less. So we'll see. I am. And I think that will carry over. And you mentioned about getting baby hand-me-downs. So that's been one last little thing I want to add on is that we have already in Tubbs closet in the nursery a whole bunch of stuff, bags of things from some of our friends who have had kids, both boy and girl stuff. So we'll have to figure it out from there. But we have some clothing, we have blankets and swaddles, a whole bunch of things that we can get started with. And then between our registry and then any other little things that we need to buy, but hopefully we can keep it really minimal and really basic and not have to spend a lot. I think what Jesse and I decide to do is invest in the big pieces like the crib and the chair, things are built to last. And again, we do plan on having another kid. And also just back to our crib, we did get a three-in-one. So this crib can also be an early bed. So we do not have to buy a bed as the next stage. This baby can transform into this bed in their early years, which will be a nice transition too. And the mattress is organic. So we feel really good about these investments. And then hopefully we can keep everything else really minimal and not have to spend a lot. So a lot of fun sharing with you guys, second trimester. Like we mentioned at the beginning, we did an episode very similar on the first trimester. We'll link that up in the show notes. So if you haven't listened yet, hopefully you can give that a listen. And we're also planning on doing a third trimester episode towards the end of the pregnancy before the baby is the plan. We'll see. I mean, there's a lot of unknown and unexpected things that could happen around that point, but we're going to do an episode then, and we're going to do another one on the birth itself. So Lots more baby stuff to come, but as always, lots of great interviews, other Focus Fridays focusing in on different topics, and we're just going to keep all kinds of great content coming. Thank you for being part of our baby journey. It's fun to share. It's fun to see all the responses on social media to all the different things we've been sharing along this pregnancy journey, and keep connecting with us, sharing with us, and we'll keep sharing with you. Yeah, everything Jesse said. And if you want to keep up with week to week stuff that's happening with the pregnancy, be sure to follow me at Marnie Wasserman and follow Ultimate Health Podcast, where you're going to get our stories and pictures and things that are happening week to week, day to day. And always connect, ask questions. We're going to keep sharing. Thank you guys so much. Hope you enjoyed our trimester two episode. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.